Okay, welcome, welcome all. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm James Thompson from BuyBox Experts, and I'm joined by my colleague Bradley Sutton from Helium 10. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I know from some of the notes beforehand that some of you are dealing with tropical storms. We're all dealing with COVID and all the craziness that comes with that. I appreciate you making an hour available today for us to share some of our thoughts with you on some of the challenges of what do you do as an Amazon seller when your sales start to drop unexplicably. We're gonna go through and diagnose how do you actually take the necessary steps to evaluate what's happening and what do you do to fix the problem. Uh, selling on Amazon is a very, very complicated effort and there are so many moving parts. Uh, we wanted to do this particular uh, discussion today on what seems to be an obvious question of, oh yes, my sales go up, my sales go down. But there are definitely situations where it's not apparent which levers you may not be focusing on. And so we wanna talk about how do you diagnose across the key levers where there may be problems in your business that you can take action on and, and hopefully repair the situation so you're back on track. I'm gonna share my screen here. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna use a PowerPoint document together as we go through our conversation. Um, we will be taking questions and answers at the end of the discussion and certainly welcome discussion uh, th throughout. So let's um, let's do a qu quick introductions here. Uh, Bradley, do you want to do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. For uh, I see some familiar names here in the attendees, but for those who don't know me, my name is Bradley, and I am the director of training and chief evangelist here at Helium Ten. Uh, I uh, was a consultant for Amazon sellers before then, so I was on you know your side of the aisle uh, before then. Um, I, I launched over 400 products for different uh, companies. Uh, never for myself. Uh, I was doing everything for other companies I worked for or for clients. And then uh, I used to use Helium 10. That's how they found me. And they're like, hey, you should come work for us. And, and the rest is history. Um, I, I keep my knowledge fresh, though. Um, I, I understand that in this day and age, if you're trying to be an educator on Amazon, you can't just use your whatever worked for you in 2017 and 2018 or something because everything has changed on Amazon as, as we know. And that's part of the topic of what we're going to talk about today is how, how things constantly change. So I've in the last, uh, just this year alone, launched uh, four different six-figure products uh, just to make sure that everything that I'm teaching actually does work and it does. So that's, uh, that's my background. Thank, thank you, Bradley. Uh, I'm James Thompson from BuyBox Experts. Uh, we are an Amazon agency that works with brands, helping on the first party and third party side. I was fortunate enough to work at Amazon for about six years back between 2007 and 2013, all of it on the marketplace side, working both at launching the FBA program, as well as helping to recruit sellers to the third party marketplace. Uh, I've also been involved in launching the Prosper Show, which is a annual educational event that some of you may have participated in, um, and um, written a couple books on the, uh, on the Amazon marketplace. Let, let's, let's jump in and actually look at the, the, the big question on hand today, which is how do we think about diagnosing a situation where you're losing sales? Your sales have, have turned in the wrong direction and you're not sure where to go to be able to establish what the root cause is of the declining sales. It turns out there's only so many different things that could be in play. And so we're going to talk about what those different dynamics are and what kinds of internal and external tools are available to help do the diagnosis. Think of it as a patient comes into the emergency room, there's something wrong with them, you don't know what's wrong. And so figuring out what are all those diagnostic tests that you need to go through to evaluate what in fact uh, may be causing, uh, causing the, the pain points for the patient, or in this case, your third party seller account. So very quickly, um, if you think about your sales on Amazon, at, at the absolute lowest level, there's only three types of factors that ultimately drive your sales. The amount of traffic at the top of the sales funnel, the amount of traffic that converts, and then your pricing uh, on the product. So if you're not getting enough traffic, you're not gonna have traffic coming to your site that will eventually convert open up its wallet and start making payments for, for some of the products that you're selling. And so we're gonna talk through not only these three high level issues, but also granularity within each one of them and talk about the types of data sets that are available to go look at to make some of those diagnoses. It is important to understand our whole conversation today is ASIN specific. If you're seeing declining sales in general across your account, 
being able to figure out the exact root cause needs to start by first breaking the problem into an ASIN by ASIN discussion. You may have some products that are up, some sales uh, product sales that are down. Until you de-average and look at the particular ASIN, you're gonna have a very hard time figuring out exactly what the problem is. You may have multiple SKUs that are suffering through the same types of problems, but the discussion needs to happen at the ASIN level for us to be effective at being able to diagnose and then treat the problem. So um, just a quick reminder here, as we think about the sales funnel on Amazon, we talked about traffic at the top of the funnel. We're talking about how much traffic, both organic and paid traffic you have within the Amazon, uh, within the Amazon site. Also for some brands, they may be driving external traffic that's not part of the traffic they're already generating on Amazon. If the total traffic has dropped quite a bit, then it's gonna have an impact naturally at different parts of your funnel uh, th throughout, the rest of the, throughout the rest of the process. Um, once we move beyond traffic and we look at customer conversion, th there are literally 30, 35 different metrics we could be looking at. We've included here some of the most important metrics around, are your products prime eligible? If they're not prime eligible, the likelihood that customers are gonna buy them, that, that is likely to drop. Do you have the right kind of content uh, to help customers work through the problems that they're trying to solve in evaluating your product for their particular needs. Do you have enough reviews to help customers gauge the likely quality of your product? Uh, do you even have buy box eligibility on your products? You, you could have an amazing product with amazing reviews, but if you're not buy box eligible, uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be very detrimental to the likelihood that you end up converting customers into buying customers. Um, as, as we talk about pricing, uh, we're, we're talking not only what is the absolute price level, you know, is this a $40 item compared to competitors selling at $30, but, but we also want to know the higher the price point, the, the slower customers will be typically to buy a product. And so you've got to understand both the absolute price and your price relative to substitutable competitor products. And then finally, are there recent changes in your pricing? Sharp changes up, sharp changes down that may be resulting in customers either being more likely or less likely to purchase your product. So with, with that very, very uh, high level sales funnel discussion, I wanna, wanna spend a minute and talk through where, what are some of these particular metrics and where can you find them today as you think about ways to diagnose by looking at data within Seller Central. So we talked about organic traffic, paid traffic, uh, <clears throat> ad, ad budget, these are all tools that you can pull information out of Seller Central. Um, as we go through today's discussion, uh, one, one of the recurring themes you'll see is there are a lot of the same pieces of data within Helium 10 tools. Um, I'm not recommending people use Seller Central. I'm not recommending people use Helium 10. There are certainly, if you are using Helium 10, some of the data is presented in a much more user-friendly manner than what Seller Central would present. Uh, but it is important to understand that there are different ways to compile the information that you might need. Um, long list of stuff here. And again, we, we will share this deck after the presentation, but as you look at different conversion metrics around the types of product content, whether you're prime eligible, whether you in fact have inventory on hand, these are all the types of metrics that you should be looking at as you go through the process of evaluating why have my sales dropped? We're not gonna talk about every single one of these metrics in today's discussion but I'm happy to provide this, as I say, as, as part of the file that we share after our discussion so that you can, you can work through those because uh, in some of your particular situations, you may have uh, some of these metrics coming into play, driving lower sales. Lots of stuff here. And again, I, I don't want to burden everyone by reading all of this through our discussion, but there are a number of different metrics within the conversion stages where you're going to need to go in and evaluate, do we have the right kind of content? Are we buy box eligible? Do we have additional competition on the listing that's hurting our buy box percentage? All of these types of things, not only do you wanna measure at a particular point in time, to see historically have our levels changed and is that causing a slow decline in our overall sales? Uh, with pr pricing, more information we talked about here in terms of your absolute pricing, your relative pricing, uh, looking at some of the prices that you may have external to Amazon, uh, you know, there are, there are map monitoring tools that you can use that will uh, help you understand, are your products on Amazon 
potentially higher or lower priced than the same products available elsewhere. All of this plays into Amazon's willingness to award a buy box to anybody and potentially award it to you in particular. So with all of that, I'm gonna turn things over to Bradley to take us through a particular case study, uh, which will help to provide a lot more context to the, the, the whole process of diagnosing what happens when we have a decrease in sales. Bradley, do you wanna take it from here? I was kicking back there. You're doing great. <laughs> hey, James. Well, guys, um, uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Project X that we did on YouTube, it, it was a case study where we actually launched a couple of products uh, late last year. And, and this is one of them. This was a, a, a coffin shelf. This is a, a live product that you guys can, can see on Amazon now. You know, we're not making this up. You can just type in coffin shelf on Amazon and you'll see this. And uh, there's something interesting that I noticed when we were preparing this. This is, this is something that, you know, probably I should have been doing in real time, but you know, hey, Helium 10 is my main job. This is, was just a side case study we did. But uh, as I dove into it, you know, when James first talked to me about this webinar, I was like, wait a minute, this is, uh, there's some interesting trends here. Let's see if we can diagnose what exactly happened. So as you can see on the next slide here, there's going to be a, a chart of the revenue over time. Let me explain what you guys are, are, are looking at right here. So this is just a screenshot from our Helium 10 Profits tool that shows uh, the sales uh, since about the middle of February. And so for the next few slides, we're gonna be talking about these different chunks in time. So you see where there's uh, three lines there. So that first chunk is from about the, the end of February until about March. You, you can see sales were, were, were pretty low, right? Uh, then from April to May, that middle chunk there, you can see obvious there's you know double, if not more, triple the sales uh, during that time. But then all of a sudden towards the end of May on until June, now, again, you see a drop. It didn't drop all the way back to February, March levels, but you see a drop. So basically our, our homework is this, what we're gonna do today is, hey, can we dive into the numbers? All of those things that James was mentioning in the previous slides, can we dive into there to, to get some like why? You know, how, how many times in a Facebook group do you see, why are my sales down? You know, like, did anybody else have a bad day? Like, you see this constantly, but I don't see too many answers as far as why? So that's what we're going to dive into. Let, let's dive a little bit deeper now into the, actually the, yep. the page views. Now this here is from Seller Central. Okay. So this is in Seller Central, your detail page, sales and traffic. This is the only place, you know, actually, you know, little known fact, tools can't display this. Helium 10 doesn't have this because this is something that you can only get in your Seller Central account. It's very important that you guys uh, understand these metrics here. So under the detail uh, page, sales and traffic, as you see on the top right there, I had put that first uh, block of dates, all right, from late February to March. And as you can see, there was a total of about 12,000 page views, which uh, works out to about uh, 300 a day. And the average daily sales during that period of time was eight. You know, some might say, well, that's a how, how are there eight people a day who wants a, a shelf shaped like a coffin? But as you see, as you're going to yep. see, this is going to go uh, more. One sale per 35 page views. Take a look at the second uh, group of dates here from early April now to mid May the page views jumped way up, all right? About uh, 17,500, so it went to 450 a day, all right? Almost a 50% jump up in page views per day. But look at this, the average daily sales went to 26 per day or one sale for every 16 page views. So there's that spike in the sales we see. Now, the last part here, the last um, time period was from that day from the, uh, kind of middle towards the end of May through the middle of June. And now we see a sharp drop in the page views um, uh, from, or from, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the overall page views of 9,000, still 440 a day. So the, the per day is not too bad. But what we see the sharp drop in is actually the one sale per 26 page views, all right? It, it didn't get so bad like it was in the first part but it definitely dropped, all right? Average daily sales, 17. We had a huge drop off in the sales as well. So what are the questions that we need to ask based on this information? Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and, and ask those. So number one, first of all, what brought more page views in May, all right? So that middle section, why was there the spike in page views? Uh, number two, why did the conversion seem to go up? 
All right, that's something you guys need to be asking yourselves when that happens. Not just be happy about it. Oh, this is great. I got more conversions. Woohoo. No, ask yourself yep. why. Don't always just ask yourself why when something bad happens. You need to ask yourself why when something good happens so you can double down on that if possible. Yep. And number three, why did conversion and sales dip in June? I mean, it was still better. It didn't go back to February, March, but hey, you need to understand why it dipped. So let, let's, uh, let's dive into that a little bit further here. Um, one thing you guys can do, uh, it doesn't matter if you have Helium 10 or not. If you have Helium 10, you can use Cerebro to do a reverse ASIN search so you can see the highest search volume keywords where you, your own product is ranking like let's say in the top five or top 10 because that's obviously where you're probably getting a lot of sales. You don't have Helium 10? No worries. If you've got brand registry, and I know a lot of you are uh, you know, larger brands, you probably have access to brand registry. If not, you need to get on that right away. You have access to something called brand analytics. And through there, you can see where you're one of the top three uh, products on Amazon getting clicks for a certain keyword. And conversely, it also will show you from those top three who are getting the biggest uh, portion of the sales for a keyword. And so by using these both tools, um, I could see that these three keywords, it's not the only keywords we're getting sales for, but it was probably a good chunk, probably like a good 50 to 75% of the sales were coming from these key, three keywords, coffin shelf, gothic home decor and gothic decor. All right, so now we got a baseline. What's the next thing we wanna look at? Well, the next thing I wanna look at is the search volume history. Uh, we're going back to Helium 10 on this, and it's, this is something so important. A lot of people, they have tools uh, that, that will show the search volume for like, you know, current search volume, and that's great. You need to do that. But if the tool you're using shows the history, you have got to look at that because search volume does not stay the same week by week. There's seasonality, right? You know, a coffin shelf, you might think, oh yeah, obviously uh, during Halloween or something like that, you know, sales or the searches are gonna spike. But just, just because it's, it, it might spike during Halloween, that doesn't mean that's the only time of year uh, that something might spike or that something might have a valley. So take a look here at your screen. You guys should see the three different keywords, the search volume history. The first one there, you see uh, on the coffin shelf, there was a spike, look at that, right in April. There, remember, remember those three different time periods? You can see a clear spike in the searches. So maybe that's one of the reasons why there was more impressions. It wasn't like some um, uh, crazy exponential spike, but it definitely could explain a lot of the extra page views. Uh, Gothic home decor, another spike around April and May. You know, uh, what was happening during this time? You know, well, that was maybe when people were really locked down during the coronavirus and, and they're possibly shopping more for things in their house, looking for different hobbies. So, you know, you're trying to understand where this spike came from for this kind of product that you would maybe normally expect to only spike during Halloween time or, or during that time of year. The last one, Gothic Decor, same thing, a spike we see. Now, keyword ranking is something important, all right? So just because a keyword search volume is, is spiking, it could literally mean nothing to you if you're ranking on page three or four, right? I mean, if there's 1,000 people searching for it or 10,000 people searching for it, if you're on page four, well, guess what? You know, nobody's, still nobody's really seeing your product, you know, but a very, very small percentage of the people patient enough to go on. So I, this is this next thing I looked at was the keyword ranking history of these three, of that product. So for Coffin Shelf, hey, we just see completely uh, from the, from March all the way until June, it is like page one, position one, all right? So that one was consistent. Uh, Gothic home decor, uh, a little bit of, there's some peaks and valleys there, but for the, for the most part, as you can see, it was also a, a page one product. Uh, similar for Gothic uh, decor, mainly page one, especially during that peak season. But interestingly enough, uh, in that third part, we do see some dips, which we didn't see in the middle part, all right? So we talk, what, what else did James talk about before? We talked about you know, your organic placement, but we also talked about your paid placement, your PPC, all right? So that's the other question you need to ask yourself. How are you showing up in sponsored ads? So let's take a look at these next graphs here, and you're gonna see this exact thing. We're still here in, in Helium 10. Um, the first one, coffin shelf, sponsor. So that, but basically what this is showing us is uh, where Helium 10 has detected your product 
as a sponsored ad, you know, not in the organic. That was the previous one. This is the sponsored ad. So again, we can see here during that middle section of the, where the sales were peaking, it was just, again, pretty much consistently apart from like maybe one day there, it was like the very first sponsored ad that showed up. But look, look what was happening uh, in that third period of time. All of a sudden, there were some days where it wasn't even showing up, as you can see there. And then all of a sudden, it was dipping. Like, it was probably dipping to page two, even, which never happened yep. uh, more than once in that middle section. You see the same thing happening in the other two keywords, where it was, for the most part, consistently on page one for the sponsored ads. But then in that last period of time, there's so much fluctuation, meaning that we were getting pushed from the top. All right, so now, as you guys can see, we're, we're drawing the picture a little bit more. We have a little bit uh, more visibility as far as what's going on. So now, when I saw this, I'm like, hey, let me dip into the actual PPC numbers, right? I, I want to see the numbers. This is great where I can see where we showed up, you know, what was happening with my impressions, et cetera. Here's that first period of time. You guys see it from February 20th to March 31st. I'm here in the, the um, Helium 10 ads uh, tool you guys can see this information if you down if you don't have helium 10 just down, go to your seller central go to your campaign manager and your reports and you're going to want to download your campaign reports or search term reports you can do this right from your uh, seller central dashboard uh look at this first one all right we can see here uh there was uh we spent 1700 dollars in this first period of time right uh for a total sales of what does it say there about Oh, there's about 5,200, yeah, 5,190 $5, dollars worth of sales. All right. Um, now, overall, that got us almost one million impressions. Oh, that's that's a pretty uh, decent amount of sponsored uh, impressions, and about 6,000 clicks. So if we break that down by day, that's about 23,000 impressions a day through sponsored ads, 150 clicks a day, and about four sales a day coming from PPC. All right. Let's look at that that peak season now. All right. Now this is April 10 to May 20th. Spend was up. Okay. So, so we were paying a lot more. Thirty seven hundred dollars. Thirty seven hundred dollars for sponsored ads during this time. Um, but look at the number of sales we got. Almost thirteen thousand dollars worth of sales coming from just PPC. Uh, the total impressions didn't go up too much. It didn't go up too much. You know, it went from about one million to a little over a million but clicks were double. And you can see the click-through rate doubled as well. Uh, sales went up to 385. So per day, we were getting about 27,000 impressions. Again, not too much more than that first period. But due to the higher click-through rate, it was uh, 282 clicks per day, if you break this down, and 10 orders a day coming from just PPC alone. That's, that's more orders that were coming for all you know, all organic and PPC put together from that first period. Let's look at the last one. And that's where things are starting to get really weird here. All right. Take a look at this. All right. This is where things get interesting. Now, this is the third time frame from what's the date here? May 20, May 20th, about to June 13th. All right. Now, in this short time frame, there was actually 2 million impressions, way more, all, almost uh, as, no, yeah, as much or more than those first two time periods put together, right? Spend was only about $2,000 and sales were $5,000, but only 151 sales coming from PPC. The CTR, the click-through rate, was down by almost 75%, all right? Daily, we had way more impressions than those other time periods, 95,000 impressions, um, but 271 clicks a day but something that's high, that's that was higher than ever before. But what were the sales down? Now, if if you're uh, working with your calculator right there, you will see that it's only down to seven orders a day from PPC, despite all of these other page views. So, all Bradley, right? so Bradley, yeah. let's let's talk about this for a minute. Sure. It's easy for someone to say, okay, well, wait a minute. In the middle section, you doubled your your ad spend, and so yeah, you had better performance and paid driven sales because you spent twice as much on advertising. But the story is not that simple. It's not just we spent mm -hmm. more money. When you look at the third, the third time frame, impressions more than doubled with half the ad budget. So something else is going on here where people are paying attention to these keywords, but you're getting a disproportionately lower 
uh, amount of the sales from all this increase in traffic. So exactly. that, that, that tells me that there's something going on with other products that you know, are driving general interest in the category, but you're not keeping your fair share of that. And so yeah. now, now we can look at you know, where, where, where's the detail. Um, you know, th th this is fascinating once you look at that third section the first two time frames just tell you, well, you spent more money and you got more sales out of the additional incremental spend. Um, but the third part doesn't make any sense. That trend doesn't continue that way. So there's some sort of macro issue in play here. Yep, absolutely. And this is the kind, I mean, Seller Central doesn't tell you that, you know, uh, Helium 10 doesn't tell you that, all right? When you, you, we just show you the numbers. Seller Central shows you the numbers you've got to go the extra mile and ask the questions why this is happening or else, you know, you're just kind of a, a, a boat drifting off in the sea and just being taken wherever you want to go. So what, let, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide and then let's kind of have a review of what we've learned so far. All right. So the search volume was fairly consistent. All right. We saw some spikes. Right? We saw some spikes in the middle section that could explain a little bit more of those impressions that we were getting, but it's nothing where it was like 10X or something like that. Like you guys remember the N95 mask and hand sanitizer during March and April, you would see like 10, 20X, uh, the number of search fund. We didn't see anything like that. Uh, the keyword ranking was again, pretty consistent. We did see some different trends towards that last section where all yep. of a sudden things were fluctuating. That was like, hmm, that, that's pretty interesting. But overall, it remained reasonably consistent. Uh, the, the PPC placement were high until that third section, all right? So like if you guys remember, uh, where we were showing up in sponsored results was almost always at the top. But in that last period of time, it kind of dipped. It was fluctuating. You guys remember those peaks and valleys that we, we saw? But the PPC impressions were way up. That was like one of the big differences. I mean, yep. 2 million right there, right? So what question does that bring us? Why did the organic and PPC sales go down? All right, let's take a look. Um, you you wanna talk about this a, a little bit? Uh, James? Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, when, when you have that many more impressions, I mean, we get back to this concept of there's something going on in the whole category where your sales are falling. Is it because there's a change in market share and you're getting uh, you're still keeping your share of the market share, or as we saw with impressions, impressions went way up, but your sales didn't seem to keep up with market share. And so uh, f figuring out w what's going on with competitive activity, it's not just you looking at your product in, in a vacuum, but what's happening to your product relative to other competitors. This is where we're going to start to see some, yep. some stuff that makes sense around, oh, there's things that other companies have been doing that are greatly impacting our ability to keep our fair share. So let, let, let's, let's jump back Bradley to, to some of the, the reports you sure. have here. So, so basically what I did was I was like, Hey, I need to define my market first of all. So what I did was, you know, I, I tried to take, you know, some main competitors uh, based on the first page of organic results for some of my, those main keywords that I just uh, showed you guys, the coffin shelf and, Gothic decor and Gothic home decor. And I, I created here within Helium 10 market tracker, like a market. So I could see, all right, what's the market volume? All of these top products put together, how much are they making? Um, what's my piece of the puzzle? And historically, what's going on? L let's go to the next slide and let me show you guys what I found here. Now, as I was diving into the, the sales history estimates, we could see that this, uh, this is not the Project X coffin shelf, all right? This is one of the ones that I was tracking and that look at where they came onto the scene. Watch this next slide here about this graph. Um, look at that. They came onto the scene uh, kind of like around the May 22nd, May 20th, May 22nd around there, right when we saw that third period start where sales all of a sudden started to dip, when our PPC conversions uh, started to fluctuate. Uh, when our sales were declining. So boom, this is the final piece of the puzzle. This new player on the market, they were stealing market share and they were also having more people click possibly out of our ads because now they had another choice. Like we almost had a monopoly at one point in the <laughs> coffin shelf yep. space. But now, you know, so like, let me just take you guys through the buyer journey, right? You know, somebody 
you know, types in coffin shell for something maybe they saw our sponsored ad or they, they did it in Gothic decor. They clicked into our listing and they're scrolling there on the page. And it wasn't like there were other relevant products showing up in sponsored ads, you know, in the sponsored products on the bottom there. So like, what would people end up doing? Hey, our conversion rate was super high in that middle time because we were the only game in town and people would just, hey, they clicked on our ad. Now they bought our product. Now, all of a sudden though, people scroll down to the bottom and they see this other coffin shelf. It's like, oh, wait a minute. This is pretty interesting. At the very least, people are clicking out of it, right? What happens, guys, in sponsored ads? The way sponsored ads, it's not just one uh, impression and, and that's it. So let's say somebody clicked on the, your sponsored ad for our, our, or our sponsored ad for the Project X and they didn't buy at the time. Now they start going all over Amazon, right? They, they go to another, they go to this other coffin shelf. They, they go to something else. Our, the sponsored ad follows them. Each of those is an impression. So where the, the buck stopped here, kind of like before, people would just buy our product. Now people are, have see these other options and now there's all these more impressions. And guess what? You know, our click-through rate is going to go down because of all these other Im impressions. So um, let, let's, let's put it all together here on, on the next slide and just recap our journey to kind of find and deduce uh, what exactly happened here. So we looked at the revenue over time. That was that first graph that we showed it. And that's what you guys should do. Hey, my sales are up, my sales are down. What's going on? Hey, graph it all out, all right? So that's, that, 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 that's the output of mm -hmm. all these other inputs. So you're, you're gonna see your sales went up or down and that's gonna yep. trigger a need to look at some of these input metrics. Absolutely, absolutely. And what are some of these metrics? All right, well, we, we see there number two, page view, the impressions. You can only get that in Seller Central. Make sure to take a look at that. And don't look at it just in the, if, if I would have just looked at that from March and then put it all the way to June or July or something, I wouldn't have been able to see trends. Break it up into sections where, so that you could, you know, you can really dive in deep and examine what's going on. Uh, next step, we identified the top keywords that were generating sales, all right? Sales on Amazon, if I'm not pushing a lot of outside traffic, you know, if I don't have some big social media campaign or something that I'm doing, where's our sales coming from? It's coming from keywords, either organic or PPC, still coming from keyword searches, all right? So you've got to identify where the biggest chunk of your sales are coming from, which keywords. Then, hey, dive into the search volume over the time. Did, are more people searching for these keywords than before? Are less people searching for these keywords? You need to look into that. Once you, you've done that, next thing is look into your organic position of the keyword, all right? So are, are you on page one? Are you at the top of page one? Are you at the middle of page one? Have you fallen off of page one? Yep. Where are you showing up for in organic results? Do that same thing for the sponsored results. Okay, uh, are you the first sponsored ad that comes up, meaning that you're probably at the top of the page? Or are you the eighth or ninth, which doesn't sound so bad, but until you realize that the eighth or ninth sponsored ad that shows up on our search results, that's page two. So probably you're not even being seen as much anymore. Then take a look at your PPC spend and its performance. You, that was probably one of the most telling slides there on how the impressions and sponsored ad popped way up and our uh, click-through rate and conversion went way down on the keywords. That really showed me that something else is going on. And that's what brought us to that final step is if you're a track, track your markets, don't just, you know, be so laser focused. You're only, you know, worrying about your own rank and, and your own sales, but be monitoring your top competitors and even maybe newer players in the market. And more times than not, almost every time, if you've gone through all of these steps, this last step here, that is what's going to show you of why something went up. Like maybe, maybe the sales went up because guess what? One of your competitors went out of stock or went off of Amazon, got suspended, whatever. Now all eyes are on you. Or on the flip side, like on our case here, when sales go down, it's because somebody's eating into our market share. So Bradley, let's go back one slide. I want to ask sure. you, here's a key competitor that shows up and all of a sudden is, is practically doubling its visibility. How can we use some of the same metrics we've talked about here to figure out what it is that these guys did to become so relevant? Sure. As I think about everyone that's here on the phone, we'd all love to go and eat half the lunch of our competitors. How, how do we focus on wh where we should be playing 
our effort, planting our efforts around, you know, growing disproportionately relative to our competitors. So, yeah. I mean, and let's assume ahead, everything here was done white hat by the competitors. I'm not saying it wasn't, yeah. but let's assume everything's being done white hat. How do I diagnose where there's opportunity for me to take advantage of product gaps that the competitive set out there may, may be currently, uh, you know, underperforming on certain things. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's a super important uh, thing that people need to be looking at. Now, I would say it's half and half. Half of it, probably, they're just maybe duplicating or piggybacking on your success. You know, maybe they got Helium 10, they got another tool, they got brand analytics, they can see, hey, this, uh, this um, Manny's Mysterious Oddities, you, you like that uh, brand name, <laughs> James? If we ever work on a project together, don't worry, I'll name a brand after you. Uh, for those who don't know, Manny is the Coates is the founder of, of Helium 10. So we named uh, this brand after him. But they, they were, maybe they were looking at our product. They're like, wow, they're doing great on co coffin shelf, gothic decor, gothic home decor. We're going to double down and, and try and rank really high on that. And, and you, will, you would see that. If you are tracking them here in Market Tracker, or Keyword Tracker, or whatever you're using, you would see, hey, maybe they got to the very top of page one. But here is something that I don't see enough sellers doing. And here's the thing. This coffin shelf was launched at the end of last year. Now, for a coffin shelf, probably the, the same keywords usually, I mean, it doesn't change over time what people search, but it could be. It could be there is some new trending keyword that maybe at the time you launched your product, you didn't even realize about it. And if you are not doing analysis on the newer players or even on the, the trends or your, your customer avatar, you might not realize that now all of a sudden people are using macabre decor or something, which is something I learned about studying this niche. It, it macabre means like something to do with death or something like that, right? Uh, and you don't even have that keyword in your listing. So when you see somebody pop up like this, one of the first suggestions I would do is those same two things, brand analytics and using Cerebro to go see, are they ranking for some pretty nice keywords that have some decent search volume that aren't even on your roadmap? And if so, guess what? Hey, you need to go and add those keywords to your listing and maybe start sending sponsored ads to it. And you, you've already got the advantage over new players because you're established. You, Amazon loves uh, you know, so, uh, products that have been doing well consistently for a keyword. It's, it's harder to knock them off. Now, you can take that uh, advantage, though, and start ranking for those keywords that you didn't even realize were relevant to your niche. And that's when you can really make sure that you're staying ahead of the competition. Yep, yep, that's great, Bradley. Uh, certainly, one one of the things that when we're talking with with companies, they want to go and spend all this time optimizing their listings, and they think that's a one and done exercise. Well, it's one and done if absolutely nothing else changes in the competitive set. But as we know, Amazon is an open marketplace. There's new competitors every day. Customer preferences change, and so going back and refreshing the research to make sure you've got the right keywords, that that becomes a good way to essentially early warning signal that there may be new trends from a competitive perspective or new trends from a customer search perspective that you need to be aware of so that you don't slowly, slowly fall off the cliff and wake up one day saying, how did this happen? The data is all there for us to look at. We just have to, in a diligent, disciplined manner, go back on a regular basis and make sure that for at least for our top listings in our catalog, we, we are quarterly biannually going back and refreshing the keyword research to make sure that we've got uh, the most up-to-date information competitively and from a customer search perspective. Let, let's, um, let's actually jump to the conclusion because I want to, I know there's a bunch of questions that have come in. Uh, I, I want to talk through, th this is one, one set of, you know, diagnostics that, that Bradley has taken us through where we were able to start at the top with traffic and look at conversion and then eventually, you know, in this case, there wasn't a pricing issue, but there were definitely traffic and conversion issues through this. The discipline of going through and understanding why you're up, why you're down, what you're doing right, what you might not be doing as well as a new competitor. These are all parts of the steps of staying current with the competitive landscape and understanding what your competition looks like and how do you remain relevant, uh, at least on a fair share basis with, with customer search. So. Um, to be clear, most of what we've looked at today can be found in Seller Central, pulling reports out of Seller Central. Uh, one of the challenges here is that if you're using Seller Central, you're going to have to download files and save them. 
because some information is difficult to compile or on, or Amazon only lets you go back so far. So for example, on some of your top listings, if you wanna look at market share information, you're gonna to have to pull that at, at whether that's a monthly or a quarterly basis, you're gonna to have to pull that information, store it, and then go back in a quarter from now or in six months from now and see how you're doing on a relative basis. With, with Helium 10, there are ways that you can go back and look at historical information and compare it to real-time data today. That makes it a little bit easier to get that longitudinal view. I don't want sellers to be blindsided by some of these sudden competitive changes or some of these sudden changes in, in customer behavior. The discipline of a weekly, monthly, quarterly exercise of understanding who you're competing against and what you need to do to remain relevant with customers, that's hard to put in place if you're basically so busy putting out fires every day with, oh, I got to optimize this listing or, oh, I got to fix this PPC campaign. Those little fires are all important, but this is truly a situation where you can miss the forest for the trees that if you're not going back and looking at the competitive landscape regularly, going and looking at how customer preferences are changing, you will eventually become irrelevant, even though your product is still as good as it used to be. It's just not getting the, the attention from customers that you'd like to see. So uh, anything, Bradley, you'd like to add before we, before we uh, tackle some questions from the audience? Um, just, just the fact that, I mean, I, I know there's different uh, companies who are on here of different sizes. There are some who are, who are newer, uh, there are established brands. Guys, regardless of where you're at in your Amazon journey, whether you're brand new making $1,000 a week or whether you're making $100,000 a week, these same principles apply. So I want everybody uh, to, to, if they're gonna take something away from this is just make sure that you guys are doing these uh, analysis regardless of what size you are, because guess what? I would venture to say that 90 to 95% of your competition are not getting this deep into the numbers or, or they don't even know that they can get this deep because they don't know how to use Seller Central, they don't know how to use different tools. So you, use these this uh, competitive advantage of analyzing what's going on to make sure that your, your market share stays high. So I just before we jump into the particular questions, I wanna remind the audience, yes, we will be sharing a recording of the today's discussion. Yes, we will be sharing the presentation materials so that you can go and look at those. Again, we have thrown a lot at you. And when you're trying to learn how to do open heart surgery, you don't just look at it once. I mean, there's a lot of different steps that everyone's gonna to need to go through to diagnose their particular competitive situation. All of this will, will be shared with you. Um, I'd like to, uh, like to jump into some of the questions and, and certainly invite the audience to, to uh, add more questions to the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, we, we had a question come in in terms of where within Helium 10 does one go to find PPC position history? T to tell us more yeah. about that, Bradley. Yeah, so that's in your uh, keyword tracker. So if you're tracking um, your organic rank uh, in, in the uh, keyword tracker, it's also there's a separate graph on the right hand side that you click on and that shows you your PPC graph. Not only from right into like, if, I, if you were to add um, a keyword and an ASIN right now, in the past, it would just, okay, from now, this is day zero, and now going forward, I can track. But actually, you add something now, you can go back historically. We're going to show you that data even, you know, a year ago. So there's a question in, in Market Tracker, is there a way to pull historical data dating back further than when you started tracking? So, same thing with Cerebro, same thing with Keyword Tracker. How far back can you go? And, you know, for, for, for someone who's just getting started in a particular category, understanding what the competitive set looks like and who the big players are and what, what they've been doing in the last six months, 12 months. How, how do you use your tools to gauge that kind of information? So the one that gives uh, historical data is a uh, keyword tracker. So, so you, you, you throw something in there and you'll see, it's great to see, Hey, what keywords did they launch with? Like, I think they launched with this keyword. Well, no, throw it into keyword tracker. We'll show you from two years ago when they launched, which one they were on page seven and which one had like some steep climb yeah. so that you can actually see what were their main launch keywords. Uh, in Market Tracker, that's one of our newer tools. We're not showing uh, historical data there yet, but hey, that, that's why we started showing it in Keyword Tracker because we got that request a lot. So yep. if that's something that you'd be interested, make sure to let customer support know. Uh, we'll look into that. Cerebro is also within the last 30 days, uh, but I'm always looking, I'm also looking for uh, I, I do find that interesting, like a potential to maybe show historical Cerebro information. I think that would be really helpful. So that's a great suggestion. There's a lot of data out there. And we've talked today about 
how to pinpoint certain types of reports so as to be able to diagnose when sales are up or sales are down. We have an interesting question here that's come in around, what are the main reports we should be downloading on a regular basis? And, and which ones can we schedule to download automatically? Let's talk first about the reports that one should be downloading on a regular basis, whether that's weekly, monthly, quarterly. What, what are your thoughts on that, Bradley? Um, my number one go-to for Seller Central is definitely the, the brand analytics. You know, I love diving into that. So it, if you guys don't need another reason to, uh, to get brand registry, which is, by the way, you have to have brand registry in order to have brand analytics. I mean, it's worth it just for the brand analytics itself. So I, I actually have that uh, on, on my test accounts set up as a, an automatic download. You know, I, I'll get an email from Seller Central uh, every week uh, as far as that goes. As far as the other things go, uh, um, keyword tracking is something that I look at weekly. I also get a report from Helium 10 about that. I'm looking at my markets maybe every three or four days. Um, Cerebro is something where I can just get a broad view of where my competitors or myself are ranking. I kind of like do that maybe once every month, but do the cadence that works, that works for you. Uh, you, you don't want to do it like every day because all of a sudden, you, now you're going to get like analysis paralysis and you're not going to know exactly, hey, when I should right. make right. things like, like PPC, James. I'm sure your team doesn't look at, uh, hey, let me run my entire search term reports every single day and make changes every single day of the week. You got to find the cadence that works for you. So a question that's come in from, from, from one seller who's got a very large catalog, this whole process of being able to diagnose why are sales up, why are sales down, how do you do this on a scalable basis? If you've got 700, 800 listings in your catalog, you know, th thoughts there. I, you know, I, I look at a question like this and my first thought is, what's worth analyzing? If you've got 700 products, you're not getting 700 equal parts to your business. So prioritize your listings. If you only can, you know, you only have time to look at 20 SKUs, you know which 20 SKUs make sense on a, on a sales basis. Um, some of these products may have a half-life that eventually you have to drop them because you're no longer competitive on lots of fronts and you're not going not gonna to see them through forever. But yeah, if you have 700 products in your catalog and you're trying to figure out why up, why down, that's a lot of work. But realistically, if you're selling on Amazon, every one of those SKUs you need to treat as a separate P&L, which means you're, you're deciding that if it's important enough for you to throw it into the mix, is it important enough for you to diagnose? I kind of feel like, you know, back in the old days, I had 12 kids to work on the farm. And if one died, no big deal. I had 11 more. Well, are you going to treat your Amazon business the same way? Or do you say every one of these is important and I need to have equal visibility? Th thoughts on this, Bradley? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, you do what works for, best for your business. Uh, you have to find that line where, again, I bring up that term analysis paralysis. You, you can't just make, you know, uh, your whole business about looking at the numbers and you now, now you have no focus on your marketing efforts or, or your other efforts, you know, you, you've got to find that line, yep. but um, systems, you know, if you can systematize uh, any of these things, like whether it's, Hey, I'm going to download these reports from seller central and I'm going to have, you know, these amazing pivot tables set up in, in Excel or Google uh, sheets and I'm going to have a, a team in, in the Philippines or I'm going to have a team somewhere who, yep. are, who are just dedicated. In, in that sense, if you've got a team of 10 people, maybe you're only paying $5 an hour or two. Hey, that's a very legitimate business because you guys can see the, the impact this can have. You know, look how much sales went down from 26 a day to 16 a day. All right. Um, and guess what? I, I, I should have been doing all of these things then, but I'm not running this uh, Manny's Mysterious Coffin shelf sure, as my main sure. business. So I only found out about this three months later because I'm trying to look back into what happened. But what would have happened if I would have caught that earlier? Maybe I wouldn't have had a month and a half of 10, per, per, uh, 10 sales per day less. I mean, that adds up to thousands and thousands of dollars. So it is worth uh, the investment of time. But you just got to find that balance where you're not letting other parts of your business suffer. Even if I have diagnostics on every one of my hundreds and hundreds of SKUs, you may not necessarily have the time to be able to take action on every one of these. And so part of it is knowing where the problem is, but also deciding, is it a problem that, that is worth your time to go solve? So uh, yes, it's easier to solve these problems and to monitor things the smaller your catalog is, but, but you may have good, you know, very good reasons to have larger catalogs. 
just recognize that there is a random walk to every product. And so if you become too hyper-focused on any little change one way or the other, you know, you're going to drive yourself crazy. I would start by saying, what are your biggest selling products and, and products that you've decided you're going to plant the bets on? Um, th those are the products you want to keep an eye on. And I would rather you focus on fewer products, but monitor more regularly rather than say, let's have 500 products we monitor and we do that once every six months. It, it's just, you know, Amazon is, I hate to sound cliche, but the 80-20 rule, often you can get more than 80% of your sales from, from less than 20% of your, of your products. And so you've got to have very clear visibility there. Uh, there's only so much, you know, confer confirmation that you can do that you're in fact doing all the right things to drive your business. Let, let, let's shift gears. Another question came in. How do you track competitors if there are so many and every day those competitors are different? Uh, you could end up with hundreds of different keywords. How do you prioritize competitors? How do you prioritize keywords when the competitive set might be rather large? The, the, the first thing that uh, I do is the way I prioritize the competitors is not just in the sales volume, but uh, the relevance to my product. And, and that's not something that, you know, is a formula. Uh, relevance is not a formula, but it's, you basically want to choose like the five to 10 competitors at the, at the top um, who are most similar to your product in like form, function, feel, price. Because guess what? That means that the, the customers who are buying that product are your exact same customers that would have or could have bought your right. product. Right. Now, on a keyword, guess what? There's 300 results that show up. I guarantee you it's not 300 uh, all are share the exact same customer base. So try and find the ones that are most relevant. And, and I see um, Elena here says that, hey, there could be 100 main keywords. There's not, all right? Could you be ranking for 100 or 1,000 keywords? Yeah, I don't care what size it is, even if it's a hand sanitizer. It could be the 80-20, it could be 90-10 rule. 90% of your sales are gonna come from maybe like 10 keywords, not 100 uh, keywords. Like that, I don't care what size of the product, it's always just a handful of keywords are your main products. Now, as the bigger you get, could you be getting more sales from other keywords? Yes, but it's still the same thing. There's still a core right. five to 15 or 20 keywords that are going to give you the biggest chunk of your sales. I say focus on those. So let, let's spend a minute and talk about that. Let's say there's three keywords that matter most for your category. One of the common complaints I, I hear from sellers is, well, it's so expensive to do PPC on those three keywords because everybody's bidding on them. And yet the flip side is if you choose not to participate in those three keywords and you're only doing long tail terms in your PPC strategy, you may have a fantastic ACOS on long tail terms, but you're not really accessing the main part of the pie where most of the sales activity is happening. How do you make sense of this using top keywords in organic versus using top keywords in paid. How do you think about that exercise when you may not be able to afford adequately to participate in PPC on top key terms? Sure. Well, well, for me, the, the one, the one uh, metric that, um, uh, you know, mo a lot of people don't talk about, what do wait, is today's Tuesday, right? Today's Tuesday. So what, what food, what food do you eat on Tuesdays? Tacos Tuesdays, right? So, all right. So you got to think about your, your tacos or your, your total a cost. Sometimes it might seem that you're not very profitable on a certain keyword if you're just looking at your ACOS. But you got to understand that, like we talked about before, when you do these impressions, you know, these ads, they follow the customer around, all right? So, like, it's not just a, uh, you can't just look at it so linear. Um, so, I would look at your tacos and, yeah, maybe it looks like you're taking a loss on a certain keyword, but if it's going to impact your business as a whole, and you can stay profitable as a whole, I would still constant, uh, I, I would still make sure to advertise for the keyword. But li like, like you said, James, you do, you do also do those long tail keywords, but if you are only focusing on the long tail keywords that have maybe a 10th of the search volume, yeah, you could be losing um, right. your overall market share if, if, if that's your strategy. So there's, there's really no cost to indexing or trying to index on keywords in organic search. Mm -hmm. So at an absolute minimum, make sure you're doing the keyword research on a regular basis to make sure that you've got the right organic search terms in your listings. Make sure you're refreshing that periodically, especially on your top listings. From an advertising perspective, the, the good news is you may start to see some terms that are not yet absolute top terms, but terms that are quickly becoming more relevant 
where it may still be inexpensive for you to do PPC on those. And yes, for some of the top most expensive PPC terms, you may not be able to afford to play in that space all the time, but you at least need to know what those terms are. One of the things that we've seen with very expensive PPC terms is even if you do a small amount of regular advertising on those terms, over time, again, over time, your organic search will get rewarded from that PPC investment that you're making. As long as it remains stable and consistent that that PPC spend on those top terms, you know, this, this will slowly help your flywheel to spin a little bit faster every month. So you will start to get better and better organic search placement. So as you think about, I can't afford to spend right now on PPC for these top terms, no one said that you have to be the only guy with 100% visibility on your PPC ads. Just, just, just plan to have some visibility all the time on a regular basis and over time, you may not be rewarded on the PPC driven sales, but you will be rewarded on the organic search driven sales. Yeah, absolutely. We, we only have a couple more minutes here. Um, a couple of questions have come in with regards to, uh, could you talk a little bit more about how prime eligibility affects sales? Uh, so talk to me about what, what you've seen there, Bradley. Yeah, so th this is an interesting, an interesting thing because throughout his, you know, the last three years, it's like basically if you don't have a, a prime eligible listing, um, I mean, your sales will be like one-tenth or one-fifth if you yeah. just have like some fulfilled by merchant where if all your competitors have prime and you don't, you know, that's like a death sentence for your product. Now, it's funny because that kind of changed uh, a, a couple of the months during the pandemic where almost nobody could get prime in some certain categories because they weren't essential products and Amazon wasn't allowing them to become prime. And so it was an even playing field though. And all of a sudden people were still buying fulfilled by merchanting in, but basically because they had no choice. But during the quote unquote normal times where all your competitors have prime, you've got to have, uh, you've got to have prime on there because that's the whole reason why people even have Amazon. I mean, me as, a, I don't know about you, James, me as a buyer, when, when, I, when I'm uh, shopping on my app, Yep. For Amazon, I, one of the first things I do is I hit that button for the, to filter out the non-prime listings because I want my stuff the next day or the, the day after. And so if you don't have prime, I mean, you're not getting in front of too many people. So let, let me share a couple things with this. Sure. When you stop, start at the top of the funnel, more than 65% of customers on Amazon do unbranded product search. So they're looking for coffin shelf. They're not looking for a Manny's coffin shelf. Exactly. So if they're doing unbranded search, if you're signed in as a prime customer, Amazon is going to show you prime eligible product offers first. So if there's 20 products, 20 different coffin shelves, and you happen to be selling one of them and it's not prime eligible, you are very unlikely to show up at the top of organic search because your products are not prime eligible. Well, because consumers aren't always brand loyal here, what ends up happening is if you're not at the top of search, or worse yet, you're not even on the first page of search, you're not in the consideration set of consumers. They're gonna disproportionately focus their, 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 their shopping experience on what shows up on the first page of search. If you're not on the first page of search, you could have the best mousetrap in the world. Nobody's gonna see it, nobody's gonna care. So you gotta basically make sure that you have every opportunity to show up on the first page of search. Being prime eligible is easily one of the, the two or three biggest levers that's going to help you get on, on page one. Once the customer goes to the product page and they actually look at the product detail page and they're saying, okay, this product looks fine. Oh, is it prime eligible? Is it not? If it's not prime eligible, the likelihood that the customer is going to convert is also going to drop substantially. When I was at Amazon, granted it's been seven years, but I was, when I was at Amazon, what I found is that when you take a product that's not prime eligible, and you make it prime eligible. You're the first person to make the product prime eligible. It is not unusual for product sales to jump over 60%, literally overnight, just because it's prime eligible. It's not just because customer conversion is better, but it's because you now have a much better chance of showing up in the consideration set on the first page when, when prime eligible, when, sorry, when prime customers search for products that Amazon says, we're only, we're gonna primarily show you prime eligible offers. So you very much want to be prime eligible. There are a couple of exceptions. If you're hazmat or if you sell oversized products that are particularly heavy where the economics of double shipping don't work. Yeah. Okay. You know, you may be forced to, to, to not do prime. The problem is if Amazon first party has an offer that's hazmat 
or that, that is an oversized heavy product, they're going to have a natural advantage because first party products are going to be prime eligible no matter what. But, but that's, I mean, that's, that's on the side from our conversation. So definitely be looking at using prime in, in many ways, it's table stakes for being relevant to Amazon customers. Even if you are prime eligible, it doesn't mean you're actually going to get on first page of search results, but the chance of you showing up on first page of search results without prime is basically, you know, tying one hand behind your back and, having to overspend on advertising, the, the path to first page is going to be much, much longer. Um, we've got time for, for one more question here. Um, can you pay to get the buy box? Somebody asked, can you pay to get the buy box? Um, I, I don't, I don't, basically, if you want to be buy box eligible, you need to play into the Amazon buy box algorithm rules, which have to do with, are you prime eligible? Do you have the lowest price or, or near the lowest price? As a seller, are you even buy box eligible from a performance perspective? So no, I, I think the answer to this question is you, you can't buy the buy box. You can't say, please, can someone make me the buy box winner? Instead, you have to put together the right offering with the right characteristics for Amazon's buy box algorithm to say, you are worthy of being at least rotated into the buy box uh, from, from time to time. Yeah, okay, well, I don't know if being able to, it's not a pay to play. It's not a pay to play. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, are, we are at the end of our time together. I want to thank all of you for joining us today on our call. Uh, in a few hours, we will be sharing a link with the video and with the actual presentation. Thank you all for joining and um, good luck with selling. You guys. Take care.